Good morning, everybody. And uh, I can see quite a few names I know and a few names I don't. So welcome. Welcome those who have um, joined us for the first time this morning. And um, I am not Patrick Masson, the Executive Director of the Imperial Foundation. Uh, Patrick is on another call, which is running over at the moment. So um, I'm Anne-Marie Scott, the Board Chair of Imperial, um, and I'm going to be talking today. But Patrick has sent me his slides because, because he's stuck on a call. So I'm also going to introduce myself. So just pretend I'm a man called Patrick for a few moments. So um, for those of you who are familiar with our our micro conferences. We've been running these um, short sessions once a month. I, um, we've been trying to hold them. Uh, just a variety of topics that are of interest to anyone working in open source and higher education. We run them primarily for our Aperio community, um, but obviously others are, are welcome to join us. We advertise them in a few different places and we record them and make them available online afterwards. So if you want to share what you've heard today, there will be a recording available you'll be able to share that on as well. Um, and if you want to go and have a look at some of the other things we've had on in the past, please, please do go and have a look. And I think they are on our website and they're usually um, advertised on social media as well. Um, so I, I will do, I'm going to skip over some of Patrick's slides because um, I'm not entirely sure what he wanted to say in those, but I'm, so I'm going to skip past them um, to the final slide he had, which is embarrassingly a different picture of me and just just uh, explain who I am and, and why I'm talking here this morning. So as I said, I am the board chair of the Imperial Foundation, um, but I've got a very long history in higher education in the UK and in Canada. Um, I was Deputy Provost of Athabasca University, which is Canada's big open online university and fifth largest university in Canada. Um, and I was there until March of this year. And um, prior to that, I did nearly 20 years at the University of Edinburgh here in Scotland. I'm a board chair of Aperio. I'm also on the board of the Open Source Initiative. I'm part of the Government of British Columbia's Digital Learning Advisory Committee. I've been doing that for nearly two years now. Um, and that's really about looking at how we embed and upscale digital learning across the province post-COVID. Um, and I'm involved with a variety of other networks and organisations, including one called the Open ATC, which is a set of open source um, platforms run in British Columbia in the model of a platform co-op and available to the whole post-secondary education sector. So that's all to say I've got a, a deep and long history in ed tech, in open source, in open education. And I think about not just what organisations need, but what systems need as well. So I think, you know, I, I, a lot of my work is now at the, the level above single organisations. And um, some of you may or may not be familiar with the, the term OSPO, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in my presentation. But um, it's it's a concept that's bubbling up and there's, there's more and more of them appearing. Um, and I think as we see them in, increasingly appear, I'm quite interested in how they how they fit in higher education um, because they come from a particular place um, and I, I want to kind of problematize them a little bit. So this morning is not going to be um, a kind of practical how do you set up an OSPO in your institution. There are plenty of other people out there who can answer that question much better than I can. Um, but I want to really unpack what they are and then talk a little bit about higher education's history in the open space um, and 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 then yeah like I say problematize them a little bit I am at heart an academic so you know I have more questions than answers most of the time but but I'm hoping that um, we'll have time for a bit of a discussion at the end of, of this talk as well that's the, the main point of it um, so with that in mind I am going to stop presenting these slides if I can work out how to do that and I'm going to switch my screen to present another set of slides which I have here on my computer so bear with me a moment awesome thank you very much okay so um I've done my own introduction so I suppose in the in the academic world um I'm going to do just a couple of slides just for those who are new to the org uh, new to to Aperio just to explain a little bit about who we are 
Um, so I'll keep it quick because there are quite a few in the audience who do know who we are. But we were formed in 2012. The Aperio Foundation was formed in 2012. Um, but we actually date back to about 1999. We were formed out of the combination of two other open source software foundations, the Java Architecture Special Interest Group, which is sort of the route I came in through, and the Sakai Foundation. And JSIG dates back to 1999. Sakai is a, a little younger. Um, we're a nonprofit based in Jersey, in sorry, in New Jersey, in the States. That's mostly because Princeton gave us free legal advice to get ourselves set up. But we are a global membership organization. And again, I can see in the, the list today members from across across the continent, across the world who are here joining us. And to those who for whom it's late in the evening or early in the morning, thank you for, for coming along. And we have an elected board of directors experts and we do a lot of work in partnership. I've picked out a couple of, of organisations that we partner with, ASAP Poctai in France, who are a consortium of French higher education institutions, and the ANCSIS consortium in Japan. There have been others in our past and, and there are other open source foundations that we obviously speak to as well. So we, we don't exist in isolation. Um, our mission, pretty simple, to collaborate, foster, develop and sustain open technologies and innovation to support learning, teaching and research. So really the full breadth of things that higher education, um, further education institutions do or post-secondary education or whatever the, whatever the term, colleges and universities, whatever the terms you use are in, in your part of the world. Um, so. We are a membership organization like most software foundations. We have educational institutions who use our software projects who are members. Um, there are then the actual software projects themselves. Um, and then there are commercial affiliates, people who are engaged in supporting those software projects in various shapes and forms. So we're a, a broad, uh, there's a broad number of organisations under our umbrella and as a foundation we provide a whole set of shared services, fiscal sponsorship being one of them, but, but there are other, um, other uh, services and, and supports that we provide to those software communities as well. Um, so we are, yes, a software foundation solely focused on higher education, which maybe makes us a little bit unusual compared to other foundations, which are often maybe focused on technologies um, or, or groups of, of um, uh, projects that maybe don't fall within a specific domain. So we're a little bit interesting in that we have this narrow focus on, on education. Okay, I'm going to start with a little bit of an icebreaker um, for those, for those whom it's early in the morning, I apologise. Um, but maybe you'd like to pop in the chat just a guess at how many of these 14 fairly well um, open source software projects come from higher education. Who wants to who wants to have a guess? Josh, do you get to answer? No, you don't, <laughs> because you have seen this before. <laughs> Anyone else want to guess? Otherwise, I'm going to have to let Josh go. Four. Clint says six. Michelle saying four. Josh is trying to get me to set up a poll at short notice on a tool I don't know how to use very well. Yes, that would have been an excellent idea. <laughs> Nearly all. Oh, none, eight or all, Josh is suggesting. So we've got four, six, eight all of them. Joji saying all. Yes, you're right. Every single one of them, all 14 of them come from various universities. Um, so I think um, the, the current situation that we see, particularly in Anglophone higher education, where there's been a move away from open source, um, doesn't really gel with our history. Um, and I think it's something um, our colleague Martin Weller, who in open education is a, a bit of a, a name, writes about uh, quite a lot about the, the extent to which we forget our own history quite a lot in education. And partly that's because maybe we, you know, we, we've existed for very long periods of time as, as institutions. Um, but we, we do sometimes forget our history. And I think when it comes to open source, we've forgotten a lot of our history. Um, so. That's sort of what I want to spend some time on today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, I want to talk a little bit about the history of open education to kind of then frame how OSPOs might fit in that academic. 
So the idea of the academic OSPO, um, some people will have heard this term before, some people won't. Um, acronym that stands for Open Source Programme Office. Um, the first of them, a bit of debate about which one was the first or not, um, but generally Google's in 2004 is amongst the first. But they, it's a concept that appeared in the early 2000s, appeared in the, um, in the commercial sector, it was really about strategically managing um, reliance on open source software. There are a variety of numbers out there these days, but you know, 70, 80% of where is built and depending on the count it. So it becomes really important to strategically manage your relationship with open source, what you contribute, thinking about licensing, um, and then also what you consume and thinking about sustainability. So we got this concept in the, the commercial sector and a lot of the, the narrative I hear around OSPOs these days is that they, there's this thing that came from the commercial sector and we're working out how it fits into higher education, how we can use this, this kind of um, model in higher education. It can do a lot of different things. It can promote collaboration um, within institutions, beyond institutions, and I've heard it described as a kind of institutional API, a way to in and out of the institution for uh, for certain types of activities. I think these are all valid um, and reasonable, um, but I also think that they're not the whole story. Um, and I do worry that if we start from the concept of um, retrofitting something from outside into the institution uh, instead of thinking about what's our long history in open education and where do OSPOs fit in that picture. I think we're missing a lot of the possibilities in them um, and I, I do worry that we maybe have uh, a quite a narrow frame on them at the moment so I'm, I'm keen to think about how they can benefit in the way that um, possible way. So I'm going to start a bit of history about uh, of open education, big word in, in, in education and also on my slide. Meanings, it carries a lot of weight. It's a debated word, a contested word. Um, the story I'm going to tell, the little kind of his, history of open education I'm going to talk about uh, cover um oh. did i drop out for a minute there jen i think i maybe did yeah your audio has been a little bit um choppy perhaps you could turn off your camera yeah i think i will um apologies folks all right um Okay, I'm going to tell a little bit of a, a story around open education from a UK perspective. You could find um, similar narratives, I think, in your, your own countries. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I, if we think of open education in terms of that really broad definition of open access, free access to knowledge, then I think in the UK context, at least, we start open education starts oh let me get my slides in the middle ages it starts oh, oh gosh my slides are oh let's go back oh well at least this isn't being recorded <laughs> then we start in the middle ages with um the 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 beginnings of towns and the cathedral schools. We start with urbanisation, um, people coming into settlements, larger towns, larger cities, um, larger larger groupings of people um, and the sorts of infrastructures that grow up around them. Um, and so you start to get an interest in accessing knowledge um, at a time when, you know, still most of the population are illiterate and before the printing press. So you, you have, as I say, the cathedral schools, the access to knowledge in churches, in places like uh, Italy. Somebody gets paid to stand in the square and read the words of Dante 10 hours a day. So that knowledge is, can be accessible to the population. And there starts to be a demand by the population for, for free access to knowledge or some access to knowledge. Um, the, the cathedral schools and, and the 
the rise of this infrastructure sort of morphs into the beginnings of the university system and the walls kind of close in again for, for a, a few hundred years. Um, but if we cycle forward in the in Britain, certainly in the 17th century, um, we have the coffee houses um, in again in, in major metropolitan areas. Um, you have, yes, pretty wealthy elite people <laughs> gathering in coffee houses to share knowledge. Again, it's, it's again this free access to knowledge and demand and an interest in knowledge. So coffee houses then were very social places. You would go to coffee houses expressly to talk to strangers, to get into debate. Publications would be available in coffee houses and they end, end up sometimes being known as the penny universities. You can turn up, pay a penny and listen to somebody interesting speak. So Again, that, that demand by a population for free access uh, to knowledge. We have another sort of technological shift, obviously, um, in, with the coffee houses, not just the import of coffee, but you have the printing presses at that time. Um, once you cycle forward into the 19th century, we don't just have mass printing um, and, and sort of cheap publications, we have the railways. And so suddenly we don't need to bring people into um, into metropolitan centres, suddenly knowledge can start to be spread throughout the, throughout the country. And this is where we start to see the very early beginnings of distance education. So shipping, shipping books and another learning knowledge materials around the country. Um, and some universities start very early distance learning programs in the late um, late 19th century, taking advantage of this ability to move knowledge around the country. Um, in the 20th century, we start to see, um, again, a, a demand for access to knowledge and access to education coming out of the trade union movements. So the miners unions in particular set up what were called workmen's institutions or workmen's institutes and quite a lot of them in Wales, a big um, coal mining part of, of the UK. Um, and you have these libraries and, and study spaces available for the for the working man. So again, democratization of access and, and free access to knowledge becomes really or continues to be really important. Um, we cycle forward quite quickly to the 1970s. Um, and in, in that time in the UK, we have the setup of the Open University set up by Jenny Lee, the wife of Anur and Bevan, if anybody knows their UK history, Nye Bevan set up the NHS and his wife Jenny Lee, a rather fierce Scots lady, set up the Open University, um, originally known as the University of the Air, um, broadcasting and uh, broadcasting programming and then shipping out boxes of books, often on trains and the postal service around the UK. Um, but this, this uh, again, is that free access to, to knowledge because the whole point of the Open University is it's an open access institution. It doesn't matter if you finished high school, it doesn't matter if you, you don't, there's no entrance exams, there's no qualifications required. If you want to study and you're, you're able to commit the time and you have the means, then you can come in and start studying and it's all distance based. Um, and this, this is the kind of institution I was working in in, Ath in Athabasca in Canada. And you see a few of these sorts of institutions set up around the world in the early 1970s. So we've got a very long history of open education, which is all about free access to knowledge and a good portion of that student led. So in people's demand for things they were interested in rather than just what universities wanted to teach or what people felt um, people should know. So there's a sort of democratization and a sort of sort of student led slightly self sovereignty angle on here. Um, and you can maybe get a sense of where, where I'm going with some of this. If we keep going forward in time, we obviously have um, the early 1990s, and we have CERN, we have Sir Tim Berners Lee, and this is the original logo for, um, for the World Wide Web. Let's share what we know. Again, this pushing out of knowledge, democratization of access to knowledge, free, free flow of access to knowledge. And most of those open universities, distance-based universities that were set up in the, the early 70s, 
in the 90s, in the early 90s, are some of the first institutions, first universities to engage with the web and start pushing out uh, much more of their programming online. They can see the potential in this space. We start with, with the web. We start thinking about how we can teach online. And we start building some of the infrastructures to support that. And Sakai obviously is a learning management system within the Aperio Foundation, but a number more appear out of, out of the education space in one way or another. Some of them um, closed, some of them open, um, some of them uh, some of them don't exist anymore. And, and one of these um, platforms ends up being quite predatory. Um, but there's one platform here that's not well, it's not on the screen. There's one platform that doesn't often get mentioned because it didn't have a slap, slap, snappy logo and I couldn't fit it on the slide. And that's this one, um, Boddington, which was developed at the University of Leeds. Um, I think it had its first scaled implementation around 1997. And it was released onto SourceForge in 2006, I think it was. And that's really important. Um, because around 2009, filed a patent trying to patent various features of a learning management system or virtual learning environment, as we would call it in, in the UK. And they were originally granted it, but problematic. And then there was a, a fight back um, by Sakai um, and, and by Moodle, but also by Boddington because we because it was released onto SourceForge we could say that the features that Blackboard were trying to patent pre-existed them and they were out there and they were well known and they were they were out there under an open source license um, so between Boddington and Sakai that that patent was actually um, squashed and reversed and they don't hold a patent anymore so not only as open source in the form of Sakai and Moodle being how we've built some of these platforms for sharing knowledge in, the, in a digital age. They've also been, or open source has also been how we defended ourselves a little bit in that digital age and, and tried to, to um, preserve some sense of self sovereignty again over that, um, that knowledge sharing ecosystem. Um, the open source software movement and the licensing that sits underneath that is generally accepted to be a bit of the inspiration for the licensing schemes, particularly Creative Commons, that then start to facilitate open educational resources. So we thought about and built platforms for sharing knowledge and now we're interested in how we can actually sort of package up and reach share and um, share knowledge itself and kind of reshare, reuse, remix and adapt that knowledge and continue to, to make it available as openly as possible. So we're thinking about infrastructures on the web um, that facilitate free flow of access to knowledge and we're thinking about the knowledge itself and how do we open that up and, you know, crack open copyright and IP and, and usage permissions and, and get a little more open with that stuff. Um, we start to think about scaling some of that. And this is where, you know, I'm going a bit beyond the UK story here. Not 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 completely, but we obviously start to see MIT open courseware where they start to, to license huge amounts of their um, their course materials openly. And we see the rise of some of the, the big MOOC platforms. Now are they are they truly open? I think we could have a bit of a debate about that, but certainly the idea that you can access them with no prerequisites is there. Um, and many of them did make their materials available, not necessarily on these platforms, but they did make their materials available um, openly beyond the platforms. And obviously edX had open edX as well, and a number of um, non-Anglophone countries used open edX to create their national MOOC platforms. The UK specific one in here that people may or may not know about is Future Learn which was a UK MOOC platform developed by the Open University. And if, if some of you remember the early days of Coursera and edX, they were quite conservative in who they let into their platforms. They generally wanted the big research universities with kind of interesting reputations. And FutureLearn um, was the place where a lot of other institutions who bluntly weren't 
you know, elite enough to get into edX and Coursera, where they found a home and where they were able to put a lot of their uh, their materials and their courses and, and start to expand their, their online digital offering. What all of that means, and, and as I say, that's a UK specific story and you can find your own stories in your, your own um, your own jurisdictions but what all of that means is that that word open is actually a really com complicated word that is used for lots and lots of different types of activities in universities um, open source software being part of it but open data open MOOCs um, open access publishing open open educational resources it has meaning in a social justice context it has meaning around self-sovereignty around student-led learning it, it's a really um, difficult to pin down word with a lot of really um, rich it's got a rich history and a lot of rich meaning around it and this is where my concern in the with the narrow focus of an ospo starts starts to get a little bit real because there's much more open stuff happening in universities and in education systems than just where because fundamentally we're a different type of organization to a commercial company producing a product of some variety so i particularly appreciate um uh, stephen jacob from the rochester institute of i am um, technologies uh, open work definition where he's really tried to step back and look at that big picture of all the kinds of open work that happen in institutions and all the types of definitions that exist for them there's you know obviously open source licenses it's OER licenses um, there's the open knowledge foundations definitions and and so he's he's been able to sort of lay out a whole bunch of open practices that kinds of kinds of open work that happen in institutions in a in a, a kind of structured way and notably at RIT they don't have an OSPO they have an open programs office they've chosen to soften that software a bit away and and embrace that bigger picture of all the kinds of open activities that happen in a, an institution there are a number of OSPOs, as I said at the start, a number of OSPOs appearing in institutions, the largest number of them in, in the US, um, and m most of them, if not all of them, funded by um, the Sloan Foundation, with but not exclusive emphasis on research software and supporting open science and reproducibility um, of uh, reproducibility of science but also supporting op open publishing and open access publishing in its broadest sense so not just publishing your data and publishing your findings but publishing your use to get to that point as well i've highlighted john hopkins um, because they predate some that sloan funded ospos though i think uh, these days they may have some slow money and then we see some others popping up outside of the us this isn't an people know of others I'd be delighted to hear about them um, there is one in Trinity College in Dublin which is within their kind of knowledge transfer commercialization space there is a nascent one at the University of Groningen um, in the Netherlands which I understand to be positioned more in the IT uh, space of the institution and then there's a sector level one at SURF this is the the um, research education network national research education network for the Netherlands so they're popping up in in different places in different kinds of institutions and in different places within their institutions um it would suggest that we've already had one um that um we had one at years ago depending on how you want to count it um for I um just as it was then based at the University of Oxford OSS watch existed to provide expert advice and guidance on licensing and the use of open source software for the whole of the 
it's sadly after 2013, I think the last updates to the website were 2014, um, when the money ran out, um, various people moved on, but the website itself is still available, all the resources there are still available, and I still go to that website and use the resources. And if you have a look at the history of, of OSS Watch and who was involved with it over that 10 year period, you will see names that flow in and out of you know, large open source communities like Apache. Um, it was very well constructed and, and very, uh, very, very well resourced um, and very knowledgeable. And, and it's a bit of a shame that we lost it. But potentially academia had an OSPO before Google ever had an OSPO. Again, I think we forget. A, oh, my sound is cutting out a bit. I'm sorry. We forget a lot of this history, I think. Apologies for my, my ropey internet connection. I have no idea why, except perhaps it's raining. If, if it gets bad, let me know and uh, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can maybe switch to my phone. OK, there are some other pieces that exist within our sector today as well. So OSS Watch sadly has been and gone, but there's some other things inside the education system today or systems today that look a bit OSPO-like. So SCOS is um, the Sustainability Co Coalition for Open Science Services. This is a global consortium. Um, mostly of libraries, and they're thinking about how to sustain open access publishing um, and the software and the systems that, uh, that support that. Um, so they will pick open source software that's felt to be critical to supporting open science, and they will coordinate fundraising to support that software to be sustainable. So at, right at this point in time for this financial year, they've been fundraising in all the countries that they have membership in for Money for DSpace, the, the repository service that's used a lot in, in libraries. So there we have a consortium organization creating a relationship between universities and open source projects and thinking about how support for critical infrastructure that those universities rely on, how it can be maintained and thinking about sustainability of open source software within institutions. I mentioned ASAP Poctai or earlier, the French university consortium, um, again, you can have a look at their, their history on their website. They um, go back to some of the early history of the, the JSIG Foundation. They used uPortal initially, um, but they have grown in, in scale and scope. They, as I say, now have about 80% of French higher education institutions as members and use a large number of open source software projects. And again, they collaborate on the development of those projects to make sure that they are fit for purpose for the French education system. Um, so they are that coordination between open source software projects and funders and institutions. So some OSPO like features in how they work as well. Um, and then this rather dull slide is um, a, a snippet from the Government of British Columbia's um, digital learning strategy, um, which a couple of us on this call have been involved with. And included in that strategy now is um, an emphasis on OER and uh, shared course materials, which is something British Columbia has a deep history in, but now a recognition also that there's an amount of open source infrastructure that could support the education system, particularly in areas where there is, is no commercial supplier for that software and that there's, an, there's a good reason for the sector to invest in the sustainability of some of those tools. And so there is a proposal to have a I'm going to say a pilot OSPO, but it probably won't be called an OSPO for all the reasons that RIT didn't call what they did an OSPO. But to have some sort of open program office that's thinking about that big picture of open stuff that institutions in a sector do. Um, and I am hopeful, and you can't see me, but I'm crossing my fingers. I'm hopeful that this work is going to begin fairly soon. There, there is commitment to it um, beyond the strategy. There seems to be some, some funding and some movement now in pushing that project forward. So much like the SURF OSPO in the Netherlands, this would sit at sector level um, and support a range of open activities across a sector. 
And that I think is really important, something I should have said at the beginning in terms of this idea of the OSPO as the institutional API. Not every institution in an education sector is, is equally well resourced. And my concern with some of the OSPO approach that I've seen to date, particularly in the US and the, the Sloan funded, one, funded ones, is that it's the big research universities. Um, sometimes it's the people who could probably afford to do it themselves. <laughs> they could probably afford to do it without this loan money. They're, the idea that every institution could or would have an OSPO it, is just not true. There are so many small institutions who can barely afford to keep the lights on. And I really worry about two tier systems where you know the rich institutions can have nice things and everybody else has i'm going to say microsoft but you know <laughs> everybody else gets the kind of generic cheap off the shelf stuff and doesn't get to play and doesn't get to be part of that that open infrastructure and that that open ecosystem so i'm really interested in the bc one and i'm interested in the the netherlands one in surf in terms of how they support that sector of mixed means um, to have to have access to open um, and to open infrastructures for for learning and teaching and research okay so that as i said leaves me with more questions um, and, and not simple models and not simple answers. That leaves me wondering, well, where do OSPOs fit into the education system? I don't think that they are the institutional API because I don't think that they will exist inside every institution. Some institutions will have them, yes, but some institutions will never have them. So do we need OSPOs? At, at regional levels? Do we need consortiums of universities like ASAP Poptai? Do we need them at sector level um, in NREN's National Research Education Networks like SURF? Do we need them in areas of or domains of expertise like SCOS and, and research libraries? Where do we already have OSPO-like things in our sectors and in our environments? Where is their overlap with existing consortiums? And then how do we network and connect all those pieces that we have? So I, I come back to this, this point of, you know, OSPOs are a, a thing that an institution has, um, that they come from the commercial sector, and we're working out how to, to retrofit them into education. And I am really uncomfortable with that. I would much rather start from a place of saying, We've got this huge long history of open education and open educational practices in our institutions. Open source is a part of that, but there's much more open stuff happening. And we already have existing mechanisms or existing organizations or existing relationships where we're already doing bits of this. So rather than look outside and work out how to plug it in, I would prefer that we looked inside and worked out what fits, what fits our context, what fits our sector, what fits the kind of institution we are, um, and, and work out how, what they mean to us and this bigger picture of open education that we're blessed with, I would say. And I think it's really important that we do that. This is a, um, a I'll, I'll share the slides out afterwards. This is from a, an interview that um, Nithya Ruff gave. Um, around the importance of OSPOs. She is now head of the Amazon OSPO, but has a, a long history in this space. This point of building the business case is really important, I think. There's, you know, there's a mindset that says start tactical, go, you know, find find where you can get one into the institution and if open research is where you start, then you know, start there and work it out to expand. I think I see the sense in that, but I actually think that building the business case for why an OSPO or an open programs office is a natural fit with the education sector because of this long history. And it's about strategically managing something we already do and have a long history of doing, even if we've forgotten about it a little bit, I think is a much better place to start because we will get those sponsors and those champions by doing so. 
it, it won't be that we're trying to force something new into the institution. We'll be strategically managing something that the institution or the sector already does and has a long history of doing. And that is a much harder thing to say no to if I put my senior administrator hat on. So, yeah, that I said that leaves me with lots of questions about where um, Oslo's might fit in terms of organisational hierarchies or sector hierarchies. It also leaves me with lots of questions or ideas about the kinds of activities that an OSPO in higher education would grapple with. Open science and open research, I think, is a no-brainer um, because there are requirements to publish openly, compliance requirements to publish openly. But I'd be interested in pushing that further and saying, well, where does this fit with the rise of the research software engineer, those programmers who work with researchers and develop the software that their science is based upon, because they've been professionalizing for the last 10 years. They've been they've formed a professional association here in the UK. There are training courses, the carpentries in particular. Um, where does this fit with their professional competencies? Where does an OSPO support the professional competencies of, of professional groups of people and institutions? Um, what kinds of operational infrastructures inside institutions might be supported by, um, by an open programs office or an OSPO? Our libraries, our ed tech, our web. I mean, don't, you know, find me an institution that says we don't use open source and I will find a copy of WordPress inside their institution in the web space. We, we use WordPress ubiquitously across education. So there's some real no brainer areas there as well, I think. I think we could really um, do much more on paths to sustainability and scale for open source software projects. I said at the start, all of those projects started in higher education. They found their pathway to scale and to sustainability, in many cases through joining foundations or forming foundations. A number of them are perio projects and they found their way into, into our foundation. How do we nurture more of those kinds of projects and create a pipeline for sustainability for them? I think there are, in the OER space, there are new types of artefacts that we want to start sharing. Um, in the AR and VR space, um, AI is going to be a challenge for us. And I've mentioned remote labs. This is the kind of hardware, software, sort of internet of things nexus space where, again, we're going to want to start sharing openly more of the, the next generation of our red tech infrastructures. And we're going to need supports to do that. We're going to need new licensing to do that. We're going to need new repositories to do that, new technologies to do that, new standards to do some of this stuff. Where are they in, where's the enabling infrastructure for that? Teaching open source in the curriculum, we should probably be doing a bit more of that. Um, and then, yes, that intersection with all those other opens in the education system. So, again, I, I, I'm probably getting boring. <laughs> that, that narrative of it comes from outside and we're retrofitting it in, I think we really risk missing the potential of this moment where we could grab the kind of where we can jump on the OSPO bandwagon and use it to really start to strategically manage this long and rich history of open stuff that we do in our institutions and, and really um, support that stuff to, to bloom again in ways that maybe some of it hasn't for a couple of decades now. So I'm going to stop because that's enough of me um, rattling on. <laughs> As I said, I have more questions than answers in this space. We have a little bit of time left. Um, so I, I want to stop and hear other people's thoughts, questions, concerns. Do you agree? Do you disagree horribly? Um, let's let's have a, a conversation about it. And thank you for, uh, for listening to me. And apologies for my sound and my internet. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And switch my camera back on. And Josh, thank you for um, supporting me. Uh, it's Johns Hopkins, not John Hopkins. Apologies, mispronunciation. And Marie, do you see the question from Josh in the chat? Oh, there, that might be a good place. Yeah. What are, what 
what are some suggestions for approaches to teaching open source in the curriculum, starting with computing science, humanitarian open source software and moving beyond? Um, really excellent question. <laughs> um, again, I'm going to give a, an honourable mention to Stephen Jacobs at RIT because I think he has one of the, if, if not possibly the only minor in, in open source and um, in computing science in any degree program. Um, I think that um, I mean, I think there's some really, and I'm not a computing scientist, so I'll just put that on the line there, but I think there's some really obvious stuff that goes beyond technology, that goes into how to be part of a community, how to be how to be part of an open source community, how um, how to share, how to contribute, how to behave almost, if I can put it that way. Um, and so I, I think there are, yes, you can build this stuff into the curriculum in formal courses. Sometimes the speed at which a community works and the speed at which a semester works don't align um, so I think there can be challenges sometimes I think that's where then maybe working in partnership more formal partnership with um, software foundations or communities might be a good idea there are also programs like Google Summer of Code um, and various other um, kind of internship type programs where you can volunteer and get involved in open source. So universities supporting those sorts of programs um, is useful. But I know we always talk about computing science as the, the place to start, but I, I also think there's a huge amount of scope in the digital humanities space as well. Again, different institutions probably more teach CS than might have a fully fledged um, digital humanities um, capability. But as we see many, many more disciplines um, adopting and using technology, especially in their research methodologies, I think um, the, the ability or the need to think about computation and data handling in many more disciplines becomes more urgent. Um, so Clint's saying, yes, arts, visual, music, etc. There's huge amounts of opportunity. Um, and to use to use open stuff, <laughs> and also to um, to support students to be part of that ecosystem. Um, and I, I think one of the concerns I hear about using open source in the nuts and bolts of higher education and the operational side of higher education is we don't have the talent, we can't recruit the talent, and that's where I think we're missing a really big trick um, because we could literally solve that problem for ourselves. We could. You know, we could actually develop the talent we want through our academic programming and then to the workforce in our institutions if we if we thought about it that way. Um, and Jen is reminding us that um, an earlier micro conference talk touched on teach yes, the uh, Rensselaer program at um, Rensselaer Polytechnic. That was a really really good um, talk, and actually the the student who helped with that. Or gave part of that presentation talked very eloquently about the need for open source experience when she went out into the job market and basically she wasn't going to get a look in if she didn't have some of that capability that that ability to work in an open source community um and josh is suggesting yeah social science disciplines that study the workings of groups could explore the community aspects of oss yeah i think it's a really rich area and I find it strange that a number of, again, mostly Anglophone institutions, I think this picture is different in, in Europe particularly, but um, Anglophone countries have, in the education system, there's a bit of a disconnect with that open source history, which is it's a bit, it's a bit weird at the moment. Any other questions, comments? And please grab the microphone. You're, you don't have to just um, just type. Goodness knows, nobody needs to hear my voice much longer. Hey, Anne-Marie, it's Clint. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Good. I, I, have a, I have a question here, and I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about it. I know a lot of institutions have um, uh, organizations within the institutions around commercialization of research projects. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the relationship maybe between an OSPO and those commercialization units because i think there's a lot of software projects that come out of an institution that may 
think that the only pathway that they have is through the commercialization unit. And a lot of institutions have that commercialization path kind of nicely articulated within the institution. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you see the relationship between an OSPO and an institution might be with that commercialization unit. I'm trying really hard not to go on a rant. Um, <laughs> but let, let me try and uh, form my thoughts in a, in a sensible way. Um, no, so I'll, I'll try. Um, to the point that, that we made about the number of opportunities there are in the institution for engagement with OSS, not just as product, not just as project. Um, why don't business schools teach open source business models? Um, I, I, if somebody knows of a business school that has some kind of programming, even if it's not minor, even if it's just one course um, that talks about, I would love to see that because I think that that's part of the issue that you're right, that commercialization for profit path in, in those knowledge transfer units is very well laid out. Um, and in part, that's because there's much like understanding of any other kind of business model than that that kind of commercialization business model but there's loads of information out there about successful open source business models um and i i confess i don't know as much about them as i should do but my understanding of of trinity college dublin is that actually they do have that nailed um, and they do have a better understanding in their knowledge transfer and commercialization arm about open source business models. And in December, they are doing one of the OSPO Alliance's on-ramp sessions, um, which I intend to turn up and watch to learn more about it, because uh, I think that's a, a super interesting model where, yeah, they have a, a, a better, richer, more nuanced understanding of how to commercially commercialize open source software if I can put it that how to build a successful you know business out of uh, off of open source um but there is there is also just that open science piece and that um publishing of open our open software as another research output another research artifact as well um so there's there's a couple of pieces on it there's commercialization of knowledge but there's also just how do you actually do that because papers our librarians are really good at that and publishers are disturbingly well not so good at the open bit but disturbingly good at publishing um we're getting better at publishing the data again our librarians have got us well covered there i'm not sure that we're uh, as where we need to be with publishing the software that's a bit of a gap and yeah, Shoji is saying reproducibility for open science and research means open source and open data. Yes. And we're getting really good at repositories for open data, I think. Um, but we're less good at um, the, the software piece. We're getting better. But, and, you know, I'm talking a macro level here. Some universities are really excellent at it. And Josh is asking in the chat, um, folks who are coming from not the US, not the UK, and maybe not Australia and New Zealand. Um, you know, do we see the connect with our, our open source in higher education or is open source much more well understood as, as a natural part of universities and colleges? I would be interested in that too. I mean, I know in France, you know, it's, it's mandated. Um, well, I think we are coming close to the top of the hour, two minutes to go. Um, so I'll give you one second more. If there's any final comments people want to, to chime in with, any questions? Okay, hearing none, I will, I'll make sure we finish in good time. Um, thank you folks for, for coming along. Um, for those who are new to the Aperio community or who are new to me, thank you in particular. Um, I hope it made some sense. I hope at the very least um, we can be a wee bit more uh, critical and also ambitious in our ideas for what an OSPO or an open programme office can be in education, because I think there's huge potential. Um, so um, that's that's the... Uh, there's, and I don't think there's one model either. 
And so I, uh, I think that's the challenge I'd like everybody to take away. If you're thinking about this in your own place, think as broadly as you can and think as creatively as you can, because I really think there's lots of opportunity here.